Welcome to Dad Talk Today. My name is Eric Carroll, and we have an amazing show lined up for you. We are fighting for fathers all across the United States and all across the world where you can be glad to be dad. Stick around, guys. Dad Talk Today is about to begin. Everybody, welcome to Dad Talk today. My name is Eric Carroll. We've got another amazing episode lined up for you. Uh, I'm sitting here with Mr. Lee Habib. Lee, how you doing? Good. How are you, Eric? Doing all right. So uh, I got tipped off a couple of weeks ago about a movie that you got coming out, and we'll we'll play the trailer for that here in a little bit. But I I just want to know a little bit about you. Tell us about yourself, Lee. Sure. You know, I, I'm, a, I'm a kid who grew up in Jersey and had a really good dad. He was an educator, a coach, and I, I had no idea how privileged I was until he had me starting to reach out and help families that uh, didn't have dads. And fatherlessness was a problem as an educator for him. He, he knew it. The behavioral problems in the school, he ended up becoming a superintendent of schools because he had a real talent for putting bodies on boys. And once there was a body on a boy, and that's a military guy or an older guy who became a, a sort of a mentor uh, and discipled the, the, this guy many times. It was Christians, it was Catholics and evangelicals doing it, but there were people who were secular too who did it. And it just, the, the behavioral problems went down in his school. And he was from the military and he understood what discipline meant, what good authority meant and what, what reasonable and loving authority, not just mean and cruel authority. And uh, so it's always been a subject that's been dear to my heart, fatherlessness. Oh, absolutely, man. You know, there's so many different things that fathers instill inside of their kids. And we're seeing a lack of that, especially in this generation now. I'm, I'm curious, you was talking about you were from Jersey. I just went there for the first time a couple of months ago. What was life like growing up in New Jersey? It was wonderful. We came, we grew up in a small town and life was good there, but I was a very good ball player. And I ended up being a captain of a very good Good team and I scored a lot of points and I became an all county and then a second team all state and I, I got to tour around the state with the other all state players, almost all of whom were from the inner city and almost none of whom had fathers and I got to know them and I got to be friends with them and I saw their lives and they saw mine and they hung around my dad and they came to the small but beautiful little town I lived in and it was like they thought it was fairyland, they couldn't believe it existed and when I was in their neighborhoods it was tough. There were gangs everywhere and, and there, were, there were shots at night all the time. And these guys would be sleeping at one house for a month and then another house. And they had loving people around them. They had grandmas and aunties and some uncles. But boy, these were the Newark, New Jersey in particular. Where I spent a lot of time. I just developed tremendous empathy for these young men. A lot of people saw them as the, the super predators or the predators or the, the bad boys. But oh boy, I saw a whole different slice of life. I saw young men without fathers. And I saw a lot of a lot of tough choices these young guys had to make, especially as related to gangs. So many of them just they would just confess to me that they had to join the gang. Uh, and some of the ball players got a pass because the gangs wanted to see them get out and do well. But for many others, it's, it was a source of protection and camaraderie, and and uh, it, it just was a and what it did with their families and their brothers and and even their sisters was it was really rough. And and so I just always had a heart for. For, for guys who didn't have dads, because I was I was sort of lucky enough in any of us who have a good dad, or sort of, we enjoy the great privilege, forget white privilege, the, the father privilege is the privilege everybody should be talking about in America. Oh, absolutely. You know, I, I grew up, uh, my dad was a pastor, so I had an intact family, and I didn't really understand what that was like to not come from that background. And uh, when we started this show, uh, a lot of these guys would reach out. They didn't have fathers. If you talked about having a good father, they'd be like, oh, my dad was never even there, man. And that was really hard to hear because my dad instilled so many lessons in me. And it, it hurts to know that they didn't have that influence there. And speaking about the gangs, you know, I think there's a direct correlation there. Uh you sons, daughters, they want their dad to feel proud of them. And then when they don't have that there, it's like there's there's something missing. Do you think that the people that are joining these gangs are kind of looking for that sense of family? Well, there's no doubt. And you'll hear it from each of the, each of these three men. 
that they, they were not only just looking for family, they were looking for camaraderie. They were looking for a sense of adventure. Boy, there was a lot of adventure in gang life. And look, you've got all that masculinity and you've got all that, that curiosity. And, and my goodness, naturally, even with a good father, you want to challenge the good father's authority. Young men challenge their dads. Um, right. They just do. Not all of them, but uh, I know I did. And I'm, I would bet at some point or another, you challenged your dad's authority. I did. And, and so it's what we do. And so ultimately, what I, what I watched and what you'll see in the film is that what these 13, 12, 11-year-old boys are going through is they're wandering around the streets. They're getting beat up by other gangs. So they're seeking a gang also for protection. Well, what does a father do for his family? He protects his family. And it's an older gang member who recruits the young one. So a 22-year-old will recruit a 12-year-old. That becomes the father figure. And so all of the properties of a gang are actually the same as the property for a family, except for one thing. These aren't actually these boys' fathers, and none of these boys had fathers. So they don't know how to properly channel male aggression, male angst and anxiety and energy, all that testosterone. And there's nobody, nobody there to say no. It's just one gang versus another gang, a bunch of, as, as, as Carlos Colon said, it was like a pack of dogs. Right. And, you know, it, so often we hear the, the term toxic masculinity. One out of every three kids in the United States are growing up without a father. The black household, I think it's around 80 percent right now. I've always said I know it's not toxic masculinity we're suffering from. It's a lack of masculinity. And that role of father has been attacked so much. And I, I believe it's a planned agenda, because if you can take the father out of the home, you can control a nation. I really do feel that way. I'm curious, though, uh, outside those statistics, we, uh, we, we've seen the juvenile delinquency rate, the pregnancy rate, uh, the dropping out of school, all the different statistics that come with fatherlessness. What, from your perspective, seeing your friends growing up in those streets there in New Jersey, what were some of the things that you saw they were lacking? Look, in the end, what they were lacking was structure, and it's what we all need. And they were also trapped in some really underperforming schools with no set of expectations for any of these young boys. Like social promotion. It's a look, I, I'm less a conspiracy theorist than a person who just thinks that, you know, once one person doesn't have a father, that can go through for a few generations. And this is sort of accreted over generations, just bad choices. Not, not one of these guys was born to be in a gang. And every one of them could have made different choices. And any number of people do in the inner city. They don't have dads, but they end up getting an education and leaving. And they end up doing okay. Um, but it's just so much harder to make good choices surrounded by people in neighborhoods that don't make good choices themselves and don't even have a, a father figure around to share what that good choice looks like by modeling. And let's face it, it's not what your dad says to you. It's what you watch your dad doing, that modeling that occurs. How does your dad handle his temper? Does he punch everybody he's mad at? No, you'll watch him do something to channel his anger, restrain it. Because look, masculinity can be toxic if it's not channeled correctly. Right. Our, our ability to towards aggression can be, there are many productive and positive channels for that aggression. But if not properly channeled, properly raised, oh my goodness, that, are, that aggression run unchecked can actually become toxic masculinity. I saw it in the gangs. And it, it was it was very toxic. But the problem is that the culture isn't reaffirming and reinforcing proper male behavior, celebrating it, celebrating men. Uh, and by the way, I'm so happy that women have made the progress they're making. But yeah, now absolutely. you're looking at 30, what, 38 percent of uh, college graduates now are men and 62 percent are women. Look, that's sad for the women. Where are they going to find their husbands? Where are they going to find them? This is sad for boys and for girls, the current state of affairs. And it's been happening across ethnic groups. White people went from 6% uh, fatherlessness to are now hitting 30. Hispanics are up to 50. African-Americans in some neighborhoods, it's 80. But across the country, it's 70. So this is, this is close to 50%. And a lot of it, I think, has to do with the, father, the fatherless beget more fatherless. And then it becomes two generations, then three generations, then four generations. And the government's coming in and saying to the woman who has the baby, don't let that husband in or that man in 
or you'll lose your medical benefits. You'll lose your welfare benefits. I don't think the women, and I've known so many, I don't think they have the babies to get the benefits. They have the babies because they're looking for love. And then they don't want a man to come into their life because who needs the man? They're getting the benefits. And so the, the government, and I think through good intentions, I think actually that there were people with good intentions and people do this all the time. You can have good intentions with your kids, but if one kid does his homework and another doesn't, and you give the kid an allowance for not doing his homework, you may have intended to do something good in your heart. I don't want to hurt his feelings, but you just harmed the kid who didn't do the work. And I, I don't like to ascribe negative motivation to people who may have had good motivations but in the end, their motivations weren't properly thought out and their, their well-intentioned motivation actually made a problem worse. And look, that's any parent. At a certain point in time, we can actually not quite get that balance right. But I've seen too many well-meaning people who wanted to help the poor, who actually, I believe, hurt the poor. And I've seen very well-intentioned, good parents, two-parent families want to help their kids and they keep buying them a new car and in, in making excuses for their bad grades and they don't want to discipline their kids. They're well-intentioned, but in the end, uh, it doesn't mean they're being really good parents. Right. And do you think that is a planned agenda? Because it seems like, it's especially how they, they give the government assistance, but not if dad's in the home. It seems like there's so many different things that have systematically tried to take that father out of the home. Do you, what do you think the government's part in this is? You know, look, I think it's very complicated. And I did spend my time in a legal space here, too. Look, you know, it's incentives, right? And the government's always thinking, well, we're just going to help the poor mom. But what they weren't thinking about, and I don't think they planned this out, were the incentives. And that is, what incentives does the woman now have to bring the guy in if they're going to lose their medical benefits? Look, I have, I have two people in my family right now who are on that edge. And they're, they're making enough money, but the, 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 they, they, they don't want to leave the, the dole because they lose their Medicaid. And that's just not for married people. There are a lot of poor people who have no kids and they don't want to go to that better job because now they go from 35000 to 45000 and then they lose their Medicaid and now they can't afford health care. And so they stay below the radar. Look, I think Europe has been messing with this uh, dilemma of what's the right balance. We look what we did with the government checks with COVID. Um, now people aren't going to work because they're just hanging and chilling because they're getting paid more not to work. I think those were good intentions to start, but now it's time to cut the cord, right? And right. this is what happens when you get people dependent. And I don't know, look, I've known some parents who've had this problem with some of their kids. Some of the kids drink too much and they go, well, I'll put them in rehab, but they don't try. Oh, well, I'll put them in another rehab. And I'm going, what are you doing? If the kid doesn't want to get sober, he's not going to get sober and you got to cut the cord, but it's a hard thing to do, right? That's yep. hard. It doesn't mean the parent had a conspiracy to get their kid to not, you know, sober up. And I think that these government programs were well-intentioned. A lot of the people who put them out in the early 60s were trying to solve some problems. Moreover, there are some men who shouldn't be in the house. I mean, we've got to remember, there are some guys who simply not only are not good dads, I, I'm actually embarrassed to call them fellow men, the way they treat children, the way they treat women. And we know who they are because we grow up with them, right? right. And good men want to protect women from the bad guys because there are some bad guys out there. And uh, so I think it's much more complicated. I'm not saying that the, the government at a certain point doesn't just won't admit its error. And I think that's the big thing. When's the last time a government uh, agency said we were wrong, we're shutting down? No, that never happened. So in that respect, that can appear to be an agenda. But I think that's just human nature and bureaucracy. They don't want to admit their error. They'd rather just say, give me more money or it's some other problem. It couldn't possibly be our noble hearts doing this harm because we didn't mean to harm people. Therefore, we didn't do it. There've got to be some other mysterious factors that have led to this rise in childlessness. By the way, I always point out to them that during the Great Depression, when there was a ton of poverty, people didn't walk away from their children. It was 5% out of wedlock birth rate in the black community and 3% less in the white community. Because back then, my grandparents always told me this. If you were an Italian and you had a kid and you, had a, you got a girl pregnant, you were marrying that girl or you were kicked out of the family and out of the neighborhood and you were ashamed. You were ashamed. 
And, and I'm not saying that's always good, but my goodness, it's good for the children, right? It's good for the children when we, when we make those parents raise those kids. And sometimes it even puts some people together who learn how to love each other and to learn how to love the kid and make some sacrifices. And we've gone from that kind of a culture where maybe we went a little too far with the shotgun weddings to now, ah, eh, don't worry about it. The government's got the ladies back. You can move on to the next baby you're about to father. How do you think the family courts are playing into this? I think the family courts have a lot of bias as it relates to men. And I think that's getting fixed, thank goodness. I think guys like uh, Warren Farrell, people like yep. you, uh, look, and by the way, that bias was well-earned because I've been in family courts. I went to the University of Virginia Law School. Let me tell you about a lot of men. In my state of Mississippi right now, Governor Phil Bryant was about to sign a bill looking to collect the $1.1 billion men owed in child support. Meanwhile, most of these guys were working off the books. So for every good man who wants to be involved and should be, and the courts are denying him, there's a guy who's a real jerk who doesn't want to be involved and doesn't carry his weight. And I wish those guys would get prosecuted. I wish it was a crime to have a child and make money off the books, not pay taxes, and do organize your whole life around figuring out how to game the child support system. Because if you saw the amount of money owed to women from men, you'd say, boy, let's look in a mirror, guys. The society isn't treating us well. The courts aren't treating us well. But some of this is on us. And how are we going to man up? And more importantly, how are we going to challenge the men around us to man up some more too and help these boys around us who don't have fathers and try and break the cycle? And that's what happens in this movie. Some men really get together and say, hey, we've got a lot. We, we make a good living. We've got nice houses. We've got a good church. Let's put a body on some of the boys and girls in this town who are having problems. Let's invite them to our churches. Let's invite them out to a fishing trip. Let's invite them to a, a, another opportunity. And let's show them what real masculinity looks like. Let's show them what real love looks like. Not the toxic kind of masculinity, which can happen, but the right. real masculinity. What is real? What does being a real man look like? And that includes being able to cry, share your vulnerability, and, and, and all the other things that most of the men I know do beautifully. So in short, there are some men who've really given us a bad reputation. And we need to get on those guys. And moreover, we need to try and help some of those kids who are falling through the cracks. We've got a lot of churches all around this country that have the capacity and the social capital to make a difference. And our story is about one of just one prison ministry and the impact it had on these three men's lives. And by the way, many, many, many more men's lives. It'll make you cry. It'll inspire you. And just like The Blind Side, you know, after The Blind Side came out, that movie, and the, the, the Tui family adopted Michael Orr, do you know adoptions in America went up 20%? And the Tui family said, you know, the greatest thing that happened by adopting that boy was that we got all these letters saying, you inspired us to adopt the boy. Our kids were out of the house. The thing we love to do the most, which is parent, we had an opportunity to do again. So I've, I, I love that we can be hopeful. I love that we can be the answer to these problems and that we can love a stranger. And the courts were really pushing on this. And you're getting a, you know, you're seeing a lot more men winning custody. You're seeing a lot more shared child support. The laws are changing quickly in the states, not quickly enough. But through, again, the work of, of, of Warren and you and so many other men who are advocating for men and child custody, which always just went to the woman no matter what. And that was just wrong. The assumptions about men were wrong. There are bad guys, but we have to be able to go into court being seen with that blindness of let me prove who I am. I don't care about the guy who didn't pay his child support because I am. I have every right to see my kid. And my wife, if she's a good woman, wants me to be involved. And too many women try and too many bad women try and keep the man away from the family because maybe the man was unfaithful. Don't punish your children because of what happened between the adults. And more, I think more and more people are learning that that's just not smart and you'll have to live with ruining your kid's life because you two adults couldn't get your relationship right. And I know so many married and divorced families and divorced couples that are really doing a beautiful job on this. And then I know a couple who, you know, use the kids to fight in court against each other. And it's tragic and, and uh, I, I can't stand to see it.
Yeah, and it's so hard for these guys because there are deadbeat fathers out there, but at the same time, there's deadbeat mothers. And it seems like yep. inside the family courts, uh, <laughs> women are innocent until proven guilty, where these men walk in and sometimes they're guilty until proven innocent. I'm speaking to a lot of these guys that are spending hundreds of thousands of dollars. False allegations can be made, and it's hard for them to fight that off. And even if they do, there's no consequences for these false allegations. So I'm not saying just family court, it, that aspect alone is what's causing this. I think there's many different aspects that are causing the fatherlessness angle. But I mean, for me, I was a single father. I got custody of my three girls. I, I was one of the good dads. But because you got these deadbeats out there, there's that narrative, you know, that little black cloud yeah. that's hanging over when you have that uh, solution for dads. I'm, I'm curious, what are, what are some of the ideas you think we as men could come together and kind of fight back at that stereotype? Look, be good dads. This is how you beat a stereotype. Yep. Be the man you said you were going to be. And 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 then put a body on. Look, if a guy's not paying child support and you know that wife or you know that woman, if I had a church and I ran it, you know what I'd lead with? Hey, any women who are not being properly treated in the child support, if the men aren't paying, come to us. We've got some men who will help. We've got some, you, that will change that woman's opinion about men forever. She will now say to herself, my goodness, all men aren't like that. My man was like that. Look, it's up to us. I, I'm Italian and I had an Italian grandfather who hated the mafia. He hated the mafia. And he hated that like 5% of Italians thought this was a cool life, joining a gang and holding up people and holding up liquor stores. When the godfather would come off, he'd say, turn that you know what off. That's not who we are. And it took an Italian, Rudy Giuliani, to shut down the Italian mafia. He's the guy who put away John Gotti. He was so sick of that negative image about Italians that he went ahead and did something about it. And of course, not all Italians were in the mafia, but most movies made about Italians were mafia movies. And it sickened us because that's not who we are. We own restaurants and we own businesses and we're good workers and we're good husbands. And it was a caricature. That happens with a lot of men in ethnic groups. Look at African-Americans. They're gangsters all the time in movies and in rap songs. And, 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 and guys in general, you look at most movies today in the culture, they never show a really strong man like resisting temptation or fighting against the bad guy. So it's like the, the cultural narrative has really sort of, if not degraded men, uh, 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 took them and uh, from an elevated place to a, to a poor place. And by the way, part of that is payback's a bitch, right? I mean, women right. were really low in the totem pole for a long time. They couldn't vote in this country. And so, you know, women for a while were like, hey, it's our time. It's our turn. And But now we're getting to a point where, look, enough's enough. Let's have the courts treat us as equals. There should be a presumption of innocence to everybody who walks before a court. I don't care what you've done. You are presumed innocent, period. And we're getting that way. And for the guys who want to do uh, and, and promote what masculinity looks like, be a good man. And then be a good contributing member in your community. Coach that little league team. Take that extra step. Don't take that two-week vacation to the beach. Give and help in your neighborhood. Um, your family will benefit more from that than the two-week va va beach vacation. Or make it a one-week beach vacation or a three-day beach vacation. Spend four days in town helping somebody build a house or do something nice. Then people will see what it means to be a man, what it means to be strong and compassionate and caring and loving. And that's how we change the world, one, one body at a time. We can't change systems from the top down. We can work on them. We can tweak them. But we can change attitudes from the bottom up. Uh, absolutely. And you, you mentioned child support and talking about the incentives earlier. Are you familiar with the Title IV-D program? Uh, very, very. Yeah, that right there alone, you know, some of these guys are paying, I, I've heard up to fifteen, twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 a month. It's like, how? at what point do we cross the line of child support versus some of these people are making better money off of child support than somebody's making with their whole career, no, you know? No, no doubt, no doubt. Look, the part, the part of the system... Is really corrupt. And again, that we're talking about it is really good. Um, yeah. and, and it just systems take longer to correct because it took a long time to get that way. Right. And institutional right. bias against women was women stay at home. They can't work. So women felt like they aggregated. And I've been able as a lawyer to see both sides. So I'm always arguing for the women when the men aren't around. And I'm always arguing for the men when the women aren't around. Because for the longest time, women had no standing in anywhere but family court because it was women raising the kids. 
and so right. many men were deadbeats that over time judges start to hear patterns. Things start, you know, it's facts, right? And it's not facts of the individual case, but it's statistics on the larger basis. And then they start to impute from that statistic the, the guilt of the one from the others. And I think that the, the, the father advocates and the men advocates have done a great service for men by saying, hey, uh, for every bad dad, there's a couple of good ones. For every jerk who doesn't pay his child support, you're not tracking all the guys who not only pay, but maybe some of these guys are getting raked over the coals. And maybe some of this money isn't about child support. It's about something else. And let's get to that because maybe that's spouse support so above and beyond anything reasonable that it almost is confiscatory and it's almost a state sanctioned theft. Right. So I, I want to get to you about this movie, man. So the streets were my father. When I first heard that, I, I, I got very interested. I, I was curious and I, I watched the trailer a couple of times. Uh, what was the inspiration behind this film? You know, we do a big national radio show and we heard these stories uh, from, we, we asked people to suggest stories for our show. And uh, some Chicago listeners said, oh, there's a story. This guy, Manny Mill, um, he does prison ministry and uh, he just saves people. He saves hope, what are called hopeless cases because he doesn't think anyone's hopeless. And he thinks particularly boys, many of them, just never had a shot. Some of these kids, when they don't have dads and they live on mean streets, they just they were sort of at birth put so far behind the starting gate that they couldn't catch up. And this has been his ministry. And so we followed three of the men whose lives he turned around. And it's a beautiful thing to see. And it shows what one man's masculine love can do with three stone-cold, hardened gangsters who, in the end, weren't nearly as hard as you would think. It was all an exterior hardness, a projection of tough guy. But underneath it all was a broken boy who was mad at the world because their dad was either a drunk and beat him or the dad wasn't there at all. And there are too many men like this, as you know, far too many. And uh, we know them, we know them, and we know of them. And I think it's our job to, 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 to do something about that with their kids so that they can break that cycle. And anytime we can break the cycle, we change how people think about men. And then that's, right. a, that's a total positive and a total good. Absolutely. I'm going to play the trailer to that right now, guys. This is called uh, The Streets Were My Father. I remember getting into a shootout with somebody. Shortly afterwards, they came back and I got shot. Now, the only time that he interacted with me was when he was drunk. He would set me on his lap and he'd rub my head and tell me, Daddy love you. That was it. That's all he said. But you be careful out there. Don't be doing a wrong. I had done wrong already. I had done wrong. Man, I miss my father. And I want him to be here with me, but he's not. What attracted me to the gang was actually just the unity. We all had something in common. A lot of us were miserable. We had uh, no fathers in our lives. I joined this little gang at the time, you know? And so they, they start treating me like I was their brother. This is how I began the life of crime. You know, it just kind of spiraled out of control until a lot of violence taking place with me doing drive-by shootings. And, and I wanted to take, I wanted revenge, you know, for so much. It was like just a pot of so much boiling and brewing, and I wanted to get revenge. I just continued down that path, and you know, um, there's a verse in the Bible that talks about reaping what you sow. And so it was just a matter of time before I was going to reap what I sowed. I just asked God to go with me and to, you know, watch over me. I wanted, I desired to have a father who, 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 who would tell me that what I did was wrong. Wow, that that last scene with that man crying, you know, it, it's crazy. Lee, I've seen so many of these men, especially in their older age, uh, some of the toughest men you could ever find. But when they start talking about these problems and not having their father in their life, 
they break down like the gentleman did in that. Um, about what mm -hmm. age do you see these men really starting to um, come to their senses about how that affected their life, that those adverse childhood experiences from their father not being there? You know, it's all different ages. Lois, first day in prison, he's sentenced to his first real sentence is life uh, for felony murder. And, and, and when that got thrown at him, he just went, what did I do? Why did I want to be like my dad? My dad was a gangster and he got murdered when I was 15. Why did I think like this? What's going on in my life? And he was just lucky enough. There was a guy he was going to throw down with who he thought insulted him. And all he did was say hello and smile at him. But his head was so turned upside down. He saw that as an insult. When he went into his into that guy's prison cell to rush him and beat him up so he could show what kind of credibility he had in jail by being a tough guy, the guy was praying with two other guys. And that's when he really felt the shame. And the guy who was praying looked up and said, hey, do you know Jesus? And the other guy goes, eh, I don't believe in any of that stuff. But when he walked away, the seed was planted. Wow, these tough guys, and these were three tough guys, were sitting there praying together. And so very quickly, he really started to say, what's going on with those three guys? And that looks like a little gang too, and that's attractive. I don't know what that is, but I've never seen it in my life before. Men resisting a fight and praying together to live better lives. And, it, and in one, it, it was his 30s before he, he had that encounter, and another um, in the mid-20s. But all of them have the same feeling. I don't want to live this life anymore. I want something new. I just don't know what it is because I've never seen it before. I've never encountered it. But this life I'm living is horrible. And I keep posing that I'm tough. I keep putting on a front that I'm this tough guy and I can handle it. But I'm this kid weeping inside. And that's exactly right. I've met incredible, powerful executives who have all kinds of money. And deep down inside, they're broken kids who thought they could work their way to healing. And they weren't healed. They were still broken. And this is where the religious part comes in. You know, and look, we, we know anybody who's worked in alcohol rehabilitation knows that in, in AA, you know, God's at the center of AA, right? And it's why it's such a successful program is you're surrendering to a higher authority. And once you can surrender to the higher authority, God, and that means you're respecting authority and you're on your way to fathership right there. It's a huge thing, that humility. Uh, towards authority and that that not disrespective authority, but understanding that authority is important. Awful authority is not good. Mean authority is no good, but loving authority. Oh my goodness. It changes a child's life. It changes adults life. Imagine our lives without rules. Imagine our lives without authorities and imagine all of our lives. If the whole world didn't believe in God, what would it look like? I don't want to think about it. Actually, it's a pretty rough <laughs> idea. Yeah. And that's one of the things that, you know, toxic masculinity, I've always kind of looked at, you know, men are told to man up, just get over it. And uh, they, they, that's what they try to do. And they try to mask it. But those feelings always seem to make their way back around. If you got those voids that you're trying to fill with something else, whether it's the gangs, whether it's the streets, whether it's the alcohol, the drugs, going with different women, those are problems that are going to manifest themselves later on. And you're, and you're going to see the long term consequences of it. No doubt. And by the way, what was interesting with each of these guys is man up got a different connotation once they were God guys. Man up meant share. Man yep. up meant show your vulnerability. Man up said, it's okay to cry. Don't conceal your actual masculinity. That is a fundamental part of your masculinity. Masculine isn't shutting up and sucking up and beating up the other guy because he said something you don't like. It's so much more complex and beautiful and deep than that. That's the child's response to something they don't like, is to throw a temper tantrum. Uh, and the boy's response, it's not a man's response. Man up should mean something so different. Take responsibility is what man up means. Own your feelings. Share your feelings. Um, be a good dad, but, but ask for help. Ask your kids how you're doing. It's okay to ask them. They're not idiots. And they, they want to help you if you'd invite them to. Um, so there are so many things we can learn as men. And there are so many things women can learn from us and we can learn from them. And and I, I see hope because the trend lines are starting to, to stop. I mean, we've hit these certain thresholds of 70 and it's not going higher. It's like it's like at a certain point, there's only X amount of heroin addicts and crack addicts. And then people, people go, ooh, that crack and that heroin, that's not good. 
And I think people are realizing that fatherlessness doesn't work, that it creates terrible, terrible tragedies. But the question is, what's the answer? Well, what's the solution? And we're the solution. That's the thing. We men are the solution. We're the solution. Yeah, it's it's making my heart feel good because more often here lately, I've been seeing more people talk about the issue of fatherlessness. And it's a topic that we've been needing to get more publicity on for a while now. So seeing a film like this uh, really makes me feel good. I'm, I'm glad to see that you got that out there. Um, when did this come out? It came out last week. And uh, it, it's um, it, we're pushing it real hard around Father's Day, but we're going to keep pushing it after. We have pastors from all over the country saying we want 100 of these. We want 500 of these. We want to hand them around our church and get people to watch them. Because what you need to do is make it okay to say I'm hurting. And if these three hardened gangsters can say I'm hurting and cry, that guy, Leslie Williams, you saw at the end, he was yeah. the leader of the Black Pea Stones one of the toughest gangs and biggest gangs in the history of Chicago. And there he was feeling comfortable in front of a camera, crying about not having a father. And by the way, when that guy cries in a group session in your Bible study, if you think you're going to get away with not sharing after he shares, you got another thing coming, right? So how do we create comfortable zones for men to share their pain, to share their hurt, so that then they don't hurt others? Because, you know, there's a great line by Warren Farrell, Hurt boys hurt boys, right? Yeah. And it, and hurt men hurt men and women. And and so what are we who aren't hurt or we who are hurt but heal? How do we help other men unhurt and heal? It's a beautiful work. It's beautiful work. It never ends. And you can do so much good. If you can help two or three lives, you may end up helping 20. Yeah, that's that's something I've definitely saw, especially since we've started Dad Talk. The more other men hear other men speaking out about these issues, they feel safe. And, and we create that safe environment. Guys, if you lose your family, you go through a divorce or you, you lose your job, any of these things, it hurts. It's, it it's hurts. OK. And you put it out there on the table and you deal with it. It's actually a very liberating feeling to get all that baggage off. You know, I was one of those guys for years, Lee. I used to try to carry that around. I didn't want anybody to know the hurt that was actually going on. And there was always this facade. Yeah. And it wasn't until that facade came down that I actually found out who I was. And I wanted to use those experiences to encourage other people. That's a powerful thing. It is. And, you know, in the end, how do you have a real friendship with someone if you don't tell them the truth about your life? It's a shallow friendship, right? And a lot of men have some shallow friendships in this respect because they won't share they're hurt and their feelings. And then the other guy doesn't either. Look, it's the same reason we don't go to see doctors, right? We, we're we tough guys. We don't need to see the doctor. And we're fine. Everything's fine. So yeah, every time I drive, how are things going? It's great. Everything's fine. Everything. Well, you, your wife just left you. I'm fine. It's okay. No, you're not fine. You can't be fine. Why don't you lean on me? Why don't you tell me you're hurting? And, and we don't need to go out and get hammered. That's not the answer, right? Let's talk. Let's watch a good movie. Let's spend some time together. Let's play some sports. A lot of the traditional ways that men bond, getting hammered and getting in a bar fight, not actually a productive way to channel the uh, the hurt that you have. Not a good idea. Absolutely. I'm right there with you, brother. Uh, tell everybody where they can watch this film. Sure. You can go to SalemNow.com. That's Salem, S-A-L-E-M, now.com. Or you can just type up street, the streets were my father, and it comes up on the Google pages. We've been talking to a lot of, this is an interesting topic. Liberals have been putting me on their shows. Conserve biggest, Sean Hannity has me on. And yet I, I had Steve Harvey. I was on Steve Harvey's show. So, you, you know, Steve's an old fashioned African-American Democrat and Sean Hannity is a, is a flag waving Republican. And they both agree on this. We got to come together on fathers. We got to well, come together on fathers. It's a bipartisan issue. It is. Uh, shouldn't have no party lines. This is something that's affecting the whole world. It's definitely affecting our country. And we need to have those conversations. That's that's one thing that we can't allow to divide us. We shouldn't allow anything to divide us. But it, this is one that we need to get that out on. So, again, so I'm so thankful that you're doing that. But I know you also got a few other things you're doing. You also run a, a show that talks about a lot of these issues, right? Yeah, we have a nationally syndicated storytelling show that started with one affiliate about uh, six years ago. And now it's uh, the 13th biggest show in America. 
um, oh, wow. on five nights a week and about to get syndicated by Premier and iHeart Media. And uh, what we do is we tell stories about what works, not what doesn't. So when we talk about fatherlessness, we talk about the progress that's being made. And we also talk about individual cases of people turning it around so that we can inspire others to do it. And so our, our storytelling is inspiring. We don't do the news. We don't do political stuff. It's just acts of generosity, acts of love and courage, what real, what men look like out in the field and how good, how many good and decent men and women there are in this country trying to not only live good lives, but help their neighbors out. And so we're just trying to do inspiring storytelling. And what do you know, there's been an absolutely insatiable desire for our content. And I've done a lot of big hit shows in my life um, as a talk radio producer for a political show, but I was tired of it. I was tired of always being on one team and then going after the other team when there were really good people on both teams who really wanted the best for the country. And, uh, and so I, I didn't hang up my uniform because I have a preferred team. We all do. But uh, it's not nearly as important to me as having conversations like this with you where we don't even mention Joe Biden or Donald Trump because they really don't affect most of our lives, not our day to day lives. We spend too much time thinking about Washington and not nearly enough time thinking of that boy across the street who just needs a hug and needs some time. Well, I'm glad to hear you're talking about it. I think sometimes we get a little flack for not talking more about personal stories. But I say, guys, we can tell uh, stories around the campfire all the time. When are we all going to come together, grab a bucket and put the fire out? That's yep. really where the issue needs to be. We've we got to find these solutions. So I'm definitely going to be tuning into that. And uh, I'm, I'm so glad to meet you, man. It's uh, That looks like an amazing film. Guys, please go and check that out. The Streets Were My Father. Uh, Lee, you got any other exciting projects coming up next? Yeah, we're going to do one next year uh, following. We already have the town. We have the ministry uh, following what happens to girls without fathers. Um, and it is it is very powerful. Very. It'll be we already know the stories. We've identified them and we'll be going into shooting and production in the next 30 days. Well, so there's there's something that's probably not talked about as much real quick before uh, we get out of here. What are some of the things that girls get from their fathers? Well, what the girls get from their fathers is the proper definition of what masculine love looks like, right? What does masculine love look like? Is it rageful? Is it angry? Or is it loving and tender? I mean, what does masculinity look like? Well, if they have no idea, well, they're going to learn from the TV what masculinity looks like, from a rap video what, what masculinity looks like. And then they go ahead and, and seek that kind of male love. And that doesn't last long and it doesn't work well. They also don't know what how a man treats a woman properly so the predators come out right the, yeah. and the predators the groomers especially the sexual predators well there's no dad to protect them so these adult guys can come in and start to tell the girl how beautiful they are and they're their daddy figure and the next thing you know they're raping those girls and who's that girl going to go to to talk about that older man who raped them when they're not even sure what rape is because maybe they think this is normal right Right. And so what happens to girls is girls, because they're girls, don't, up in, don't end up in prison. 92% of our inmates are men. Nobody ever accuses the cops of profiling against men and not throwing enough women in prison because women don't commit the violent crime. They do something else. They, they, they harm themselves by having babies when they're 16 because that's the love they're seeking from some Romeo who charms them into bed and, and has a baby with them and takes off. And the girl right. keeps the baby because she's thinking, I don't need a man. I don't, I hate men, but this baby's going to give me the love I never had. It's so rational, right? It's so right. deeply human. And so we want to get to these human stories of what happens to girls and then ultimately life of prostitution uh, and, and sometimes sex trafficking. Um, it's, it's really awful and in some ways worse than what happens to boys. Ah, Lee, I love it. So when that film goes to get out, uh, please come back and let's uh, let's do another episode on that, guys. Again, go check that out. The streets were my father. Lee, thank you so much for coming today, my man. Thank you. Thanks for having me.